Good morning. It is great to be here. We've prayed for your church uh, uh, for, uh, for some time. Love, Pastor Matt. Amen. And thank you for Brother Jeremy. Did I say your name right? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> uh, we have been here at Central Baptist College for going on two years. Uh, we lived in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, for close to 20 years. I've been out of baseball. I played with the St. Louis Cardinals, scouted for the Kansas City Royals for 10 years, and uh, then been in local church ministry for, for the remainder of that time. Served as uh, vice president uh, at Mid-America Baptist Seminary. And so uh, one of the things I'd like to share with you today is don't get comfortable, amen? And what happened was I was comfortable. I was pastoring, serving in higher education, our church was, uh, it was unbelievable what God was doing at our church there in Shelby Forest outside of Memphis. And then the Lord said that he wanted us to go back into uh, college coaching. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. And I remember sitting there watching my, one of my sons playing high school baseball in Munford, Tennessee. My other son, uh, oldest son, played soccer at Central Baptist College. He was a goalie. And then my other son uh, under him uh, was, was a sophomore on the baseball team at Central Baptist College. And very quickly, we got a call one day, and I'm sitting there by the head coach of Central Baptist College, and I picked it up thinking something was wrong with my son. And the head coach, Aaron Brister, said, Duffy, the Lord keeps putting you on my heart. And I didn't talk to him a whole lot at all. And he said, would you please, you and Dawn, please pray about coming and being my pitching coach at Central Baptist College. And I laughed just a little bit. And then the Lord just started pouring on our hearts. And I remember sharing this with Dawn a few weeks before even he called. I didn't share this with anybody. I didn't call my friends and say, hey, would you be in prayer for this? And before he even called, I said, I wonder if the Lord's getting us ready to go back into college baseball. And my wife's been in local church ministry along with me for a long time, and she said, if it's the Lord's will. And so we fast forward to today. It has been an amazing two years being here, being around college students, being around the uh, co collegiate game again and at a high level. It has been unbelievable. And so I say all that to introduce ourselves, but also to say, don't get comfortable. Amen. So today we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. We're going to see a little bit of the Apostle Paul's daily life as he sort of unveiled it in uh, Acts chapter 20 in Ephesus. We're just going to kind of move on today, and, and I'm going to, and, and as we're as you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you are the God of all. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And Lord, we are so grateful, even as we gather today, we are very grateful for whose we are in you. So simply, we just take this moment and say, thank you, Lord for the forgiveness, for the redemption, for the life that's in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we simply say, have your way through your word. We know that you speak mightily through your word. Even in this day and age where it seems like everywhere we go, your word is discredited and, and, and undervalued. But Lord, your word is life. So fa Father, we simply say, Lord, teach us through your word today. And may your will be done. We simply say, Lord Jesus, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I, growing up, I, I always uh, wanted to be sort of a hero. And I'll tell you what, John Wayne was my hero. I love John Wayne. Some of you are going, who's John Wayne? I don't know who John Wayne is. Saw, John, saw a movie last night on, on John Wayne. So loved John Wayne and loved the way that he could just handle things and the way he would walk and he would just, and especially as he talked. But we always have, I don't know about you, but we, we, we have that, you know, that we want, to, we want to do things that help people, don't we? And that's really what heroes are. 
And in 1 Samuel, really starting with chapter 13, but 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan, Jonathan and his armor bearer faced on Mount Michmash. And I believe we'll see that in just a minute. And this is a, a nowadays picture. Uh, if, we, uh, if we can go ahead and turn there to Mount Michmash. But Jonathan and his armor bearer was at the bottom of this, of, of this area. And you had the Philistines on one side of the mountain, and they were taunting Jonathan, and they were really taunting the Israelites, about 600 soldiers. King Saul was over on the side where you can't see, sitting, not doing anything. Jonathan looks up and says, we're going to do something about it. They didn't have hardly any weapons. And so here the Israelite, I mean, the, the Philistines were on top of this, of this mountain here. They're down at the bottom. And he looks over to his armor bearer. And you may say, well, what's an armor bearer? Well, an armor bearer was, was what we would clar uh, clarify today as a, a, a fierce warrior. Well, he had to know his stuff because he was there to protect the second in charge, wasn't he? So he had to be a fierce warrior. So Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and he says, let's take this mountain. Because nothing restrains the Lord. And his armor bearer looked straight back at him, eyeball to eyeball, and he said, let's do it. Well, what do we do when we face situations? We, we may not be, and by the way, you may remember the story. They climbed through those crevices all the way through that. And the Lord defeated the Philistines on that day. And we may say, well, you know what? I don't know if I can do that. But we can be influencers every day in our lives, can't we? We can make a difference for His glory in every situation. I believe the way it starts, we have to say, Lord, I'm willing and I'm able, and I'm, I'm, Lord, just use me. Continue that, that, that self dissolves. What's God's commandment for us? Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And when we're loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, what's going to happen? We're going to love people as ourselves, everyone. We're going to have a heart for people. And that's where we take up today in Acts chapter 20. We're going to see what does this generation need the most from you? What does this generation, this generation that, that we can gripe and complain about, that we can say, oh, this, 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 we can say, see how many things that they need to improve. But you know what? God has put His church, His body, right in the middle of this generation. And for so long, as, as a pastor, I would stand even at near the end and I would say, we need to fight for the souls of this generation. And I asked my wife, I said, do I say that a lot? She said, oh yeah, you say that a lot. <laughs> but that was my heartbeat, having really no idea that God was going to move us out of a very comfortable, comfortable setting to an area where it was God saying, okay, big boy. Now you're really going to fight. You're going to learn how to fight for the souls of this generation. And God used Acts chapter 20. He used Philemon, and he also used some passages in Romans to, to confirm that or affirm that on my heart. And I'd like to just share from my heart with you Acts chapter 20. What does this generation need the most from you? So we're going to begin in Acts chapter 20, and we're going to start with verse 17. This is Paul's third missionary journey, and as, he's, as he is selling past, he, he sells past Ephesus, and he goes to Miletus. Well, he has some really good friends that are pastors and elders and leaders that are in Ephesus, and he calls for the elders there from Ephesus. Now, Ephesus to Miletus is 63 miles by walking. And if they were to sail around in the Gulf, it was probably about 32 miles. So we're not sure exactly how the elders got there, but we know that it was, it was building up. It was, a, it was a long time. 
And I want you to notice the first thing that Paul shares with his good, dear friends that he spent, because you remember he was there in Ephesus for three years. He got to see some high, high things going on, some great things that God was doing. Also got to see some very difficult persecution type things that were going on as well. And so here he gathers his friends together. And as we see, the first thing Paul says, I believe, we need to look at. Verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. In verse 18, and when they had come to him, so when they had gathered to him, this is what he begins to say. He said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner always I lived among you. Really, from the first day that I set foot in Ephesus, how I lived among you. He didn't say, he didn't uh, share a story, he didn't share a, a joke. It was serious from the very first thing that he said as they gathered there. The atmosphere was solemn. It was serious because he's heading to, to Jerusalem. That was his goal for the day of Pentecost. So he was heading that way. That was his goal. That was his, that was his desire. And so as he gathers them together, he says, You know, from the first day I came to Ephesus, what my purpose was, my desire was, is to glorify Christ in every aspect of my life. It wasn't about Paul, the apostle. It was about Jesus Christ. And then, then as he continues, he kind of sets the tone. They're listening because they're thinking, well, yeah, we, we do understand the first day you came here. You know, it's all listed in Acts chapter 19 of, of really what went on. And in Acts chapter 19, we see that the first thing that, that when he got to Ephesus, he saw a group of about 12 John the Baptist disciples, so to speak. They were baptized into John the Baptist's baptism. And he started sharing the gospel with them, and they, they came to know Christ personally in a personal way, and then they went to the synagogue for three months, and he reasoned there in the synagogue for three months, and hearts were hardened. Some believed, some didn't. And then after three months, they went to the modern-day school of philosophy, which was the modern-day college or university there called the School of Tyrannus. Well, you say, well, how did he meet, how, what times were he meeting there? Well, in history is that they would close down in Ephesus about 10 or 11 o'clock every day. This was kind of a normal thing to do. And then they would reopen about 2 or 3 o'clock. It was sort of like a rest time or what we would term as a siesta time. And so that school of Tyrannus, and there, there's the ruins there. So it's a beautiful building in its time. And so they would, he was teaching daily for the remainder of his time in Ephesus. Well, obviously, there were modern-day philosophy students there, skeptics. Yes, tell us about this Jesus Christ. Yes, we are very knowledgeable in all that we know in the modern-day philosophy. So try us, Paul. So Paul brings his, his caravan with him, so to speak, and they're sitting down. And obviously, there's some believers there as well. So he teaches them daily. But you have to understand the history, and we have, to, we have to take into account the history of Ephesus, or really what was going on in that day. Ephesus was a modern-day hub of activity. All around the city, you had, in different corners, you had open-air gymnasiums. They loved sculpting their bodies. That kind of, kind of rings it. To us today, doesn't it? It, it? We understand that. We're all about weightlifting, and, and even as a coach, I understand the importance of weightlifting and, and keeping our bodies in, in great shape. And, but they would do that, and they also had, in the day and time, they had, they had not only open-air gymnasiums, but, but open uh, bathhouses, running water that aqueducts would bring the water in. 
And so people probably talk like this, hello, we're very sophisticated here in Ephesus. But what controlled and moved Ephesus was the temple of Diana or Artemis. She was the goddess, goddess of fertility. And not only the goddess of fertility, meaning that the crops would be fertile, but also that, that if they worshiped Diana, that their families would be blessed as well. And so if we could look at the, the uh, that's, that's a rendering of the temple of Diana. And when you look in Acts chapter 19, just for fun, when you're looking at that, and during part of that, they moved some of Paul's companions. They were um, Demetrius, who was a business owner at the time. He was mad that, that none of his, um, his, business, his business was going down because people weren't buying those statutes or the little, little figurines of Diana. And so a crowd assembled in the amphitheater, which was near 10,000, could seat 10,000 people. It was amazing. And so they assembled there because that was where the, the official business would take place. And you noticed when the official administrator came on, on the scene, and he was a good friend with Paul, he said, these men have done nothing wrong. They have not robbed us. Well, what does that mean, have not robbed us? Because in the temple, in the very center of the temple, was the bank. And so, can you see, there were even so many people on a daily basis all around that temple. That was the center of activity. And so that's, when you're reading that, you may say, well, what does that mean, they didn't rob us? Well, they weren't after the money that's in the temple. And so during a, a daily life is that Paul would be, would be living his life for Christ with this, these group, this group of men, and he's proclaiming Christ, living Christ daily, not allowing the outside world or not allowing the, the other things to distract him from the glory of Jesus Christ. And let's continue to read. Now, it's very important when we read verse 18, in what manner I always lived among you, verse 19 explains that. Well, how did Paul live his life? Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. So all of that was going on, even the difficulty that he dealt with each and every day, the persecution. But then in verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. He did not allow the persecution to detour him from what was, what was good for Christ, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house. Not only did he proclaim in the school of Tyrannus and also the synagogue that we've already heard about, but also you see a picture of what he did every day. He would take that group and he would go to where the local church would be meeting in different houses because that's where the local church would meet. They would meet in their homes. And so as he's going, you saw that what he did throughout the day that he would be teaching in the school of Tyrannus and then in the in afternoons at nights, he is ministering to the local church in their homes. And then in verse 21, testifying. So what? What did he do? What did he say? Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now, are you ready for verse 24? They're sort of on the edge of their seats. They're listening intently. Some are realizing, we're not going to see Paul again. And then verse 24, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, or literally contentment, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. 
What does this generation need the most from you? And that this generation needs to see people of the Lord who are committed, broken, and don't care about being a superhero, but care about only thing is honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. When we honor the Lord Jesus Christ, everything else is going to take care of it, of itself. We're going to love people the way Christ desires us to love people, even in the great times, even in the not-so-great times. And boy, has it been a reminder in these last two years. Getting a call from a high school baseball coach. And the high school baseball coach says, don't, don't waste your time on this guy. He will let you down every single time. Don't, let you, don't, don't waste your time. Last year at our spiritual retreat, we had all of our ball players there. Some students were there. And he gets, and man, the Lord's really moving on his life. And he gets up at the platform, and, he, and, and I'm thinking, oh, what is he going to say? And he starts hitting the platform with his fist. And I went, oh, man. <laughs> And he said, I've just got, he said, I've just got to obey. And he starts sharing what the Lord's doing on his life. And he said, he said, I commit and I surrender my life to preaching the word of God. Six foot four, 235 pounds. If he didn't, wasn't a pitcher, he would probably be a tight end for the University of Arkansas. One of the best athletes I've ever been around. He came over one night, this was a few weeks ago, and I just I got home real late from working at a, 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 a getting the field ready for a tournament, and so I was just getting out of the shower, and my wife knocks knocks on the restroom uh, on the bathroom, and said, "He's here with his uh, sister," and so I walk out, you know, and I'm with my pajamas and my uh, blue T-shirt on, you know, and he said, "Coach," he said, "Thanks for always believing in me. Thanks for never giving up on me." Guess what happened? He graduated. And that coach said, you're wasting your time. He'll never, ever make it in college. Now, there are times where I felt like just pulling my hair out. There's, you know, we're going to be real. But the Lord keeps rem reminding me of this passage and other passages that it's not our life. If we really want to make a difference, who cares about us, right? That's what Paul is saying. He, when he said, when he, when he's in, in verse 24, it says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life worth or dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy or contentment. We say, Look, I don't know if I have contentment in my life. Well, have we really surrendered our life? to the Lord, and we've really said, Lord, it's not about my dreams and desires. And when we get to that point, I really believe God is using us in an amazing way. We're going to see people differently than ever before. Is it going to be difficult? Absolutely. We're going to be yearning. I believe we yearn, in, uh, yearn for God's Word in a deeper fashion. I believe it's going to elevate our time with the Lord and the time in His Word. We're going to be studying His Word and saying, Oh God, teach me, mold me, transform me, oh God. Instead of saying, find a, Let me find a passage that, that I can put in my life today for, for where it meets, meets my needs. We're going to say, Oh God, I'm your vessel. I believe it will transform our lives. So to answer that question, what this generation needs the most or need the most from you, it's a valiant imitator of Christ. And we're going to see, and as we see in verses 18 and 19, a valiant imitator of Christ practices daily integrity. Do you see Paul? He gathers them together and he says, You know from the first day I came to Asia or Ephesus how I lived among you. You, knew, you know that I was real every second. They knew his warts inside and out. He was transparent with them. He was real with them. 
and he constantly lived his life to the glory of the Lord. Not to build his ministry, not to build what he wanted, but it was all about sharing the love and grace and forgiveness and redemption of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. And he said, that's what a life of integrity is. Charles Swindoll tells this story, and I, wrote this, I read this story. This was a long time ago, but the Lord reminds me of this story quite often regarding integrity. There was a pastor that was during the Christmas time, and the pastor was going to buy, uh, and back then, do you remember the term CDs? you remember that? He went to go buy a CD for his staff or, or his secretary, and he went to the uh, the music shop in the mall, and as he goes and he purchases the CD, and it was one that she really liked, and it was ten ninety nine. And he goes and he puts it at the counter, and the young lady says, "Oh no, today it's two ninety nine." He goes, "Well, I didn't see any sales sign." Says, "No, nope, for you it's two ninety nine." So he says, "Okay." So he pays and he goes back to his car. He's checking his messages and. And he's got a full day ahead, hospital visits and committee meetings and all of that. And, and he looks at the receipt just to double check. And he realizes is that it wasn't $2.99, it was $10.99. She didn't tell me the right thing, he said. So he goes back. He had a decision to make, didn't he? Either it's her fault, she'll have to deal with her mistake, or... Let me go make it right. So he goes and makes it right and says, you know, you said the CD was $2.99, but really it was $10.99. She says, I know. She said, I haven't been to church in years. I went to your church on Sunday. You preached on integrity. I wanted to see if you lived it out. Sometimes we look at integrity and we, we, we don't really understand the importance of that word. And I think a good place is when we say, oh, God, I'm not perfect, but use me anyway. And, Father, allow me to be transparent even when I take a step backwards, but even I'm taking two steps forward and I may take that step backwards. Oh, God, use me. When my oldest son was, was growing up, it's a story I don't, I was very embarrassed. And I always did not want my children to be, um, uh, for, for them to have to live in their dad's shoes. Because it was going to be so easy to say, well, you're going to be a great baseball player because your dad was a professional baseball player. I never wanted that for him. And my oldest son could throw a fastball at a high rate of speed and he was about 11 years old and I was one of the assistant coaches and really what that meant back then and I was I would fill the water jugs and I would pass out water and all that and I loved it you know I was having a good time didn't have to coach or anything you know good job good job wait good job well he pitched that morning and then that afternoon the coach wanted to pitch him again and I said well I said he already pitched four innings this morning I said he's gonna be tired he said, well, he's our best pitcher, and we, we can win this game if he throws. And I went, okay. That first inning, he was all over the place, could not find the strike zone. And I went out there thinking that I would give really good advice. I can't believe what I said. Because in baseball, I was, you know, even at a high level, we, turn, we used the term, even as pitchers, if we didn't have our stuff today, even the coaches and everybody, even in pro ball, would say this phrase, and we just understood. We didn't take it personal. We didn't understand really what it uh, we, we just understood that, hey, we just didn't have our best day. But the term was, and they still probably use it, is like, you're just not a good pitcher today. Well, that was my fatherly advice to my son. How horrible was that? And I said, well, you're just not a good pitcher today. And when I said that, I went, what in the world did I say? He has no clue what I mean. 
And boy, the Lord just turned on me and turned. And when he was in his bedroom that night, he said, I went down and I, I kneeled and I said, son, I want you to forgive me. I said, I want you to know I love you with all my heart. But I said, Daddy said something very idiotic today. And I had to relive and, and re share what I said to him. And he started to cry up a little, cry a little bit. I put my arm around him. And I said, but I want you to know, Dad made a mistake. And I said, will you forgive me? He said, oh, Dad, I forgive you, and I love you. When we live a life of integrity, we're going to have to own our mistakes. Paul said, you know, from the first day I came to Ephesus, how I lived among you. Not perfect. You know that I was committed in, in, in glorifying Christ in everything. But there are times where I may not have done the best I believe if we are going to, 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 uh, to live a valiant life of, of imitating Christ in front of this generation, we're going to have to be uh, and live a life of integrity. And we see in verse 20, if we're going to live a life of integrity, we have to practice daily teaching. But let's don't go too fast because we have to understand if we're going to live a life of integrity, what are the ingredients of that? In verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility. That's the first step, I believe, if we're going to live a life of integrity. We're going to be serving the Lord with all humility. That's what Paul said. He said, you know what manner that I, that I lived that I, when I came to Ephesus and what manner I always lived among you each and every day from the first day I got here until the day that I left. Served the Lord with all humility. That it's not about Paul. It's about Christ. But then as he continues, I believe that as we're living a life of integrity Verse 20 is going to be evident in our lives, and that verse 20 is going, we're going to be, we're going to live a life of teaching. And he says, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. Help me here. Let's say I'm a new dad. I've got a three-year-old. And you're watching me as I as just father this child. And the three-year-old's walking uh, to an open flame on the kitchen stove and you grab me by the arm and says well, he's, he's walking to the stove <laughs> don't worry about it he'll learn how to make decisions on his own stand back I'm super father I can do all you know <laughs> and you'll be looking at me going have you lost your mind and then as the little three-year-old gets closer and closer and closer then if I were to say, nope, he's going to have to learn the hard way, you would look at me and say, you know, who are you, wouldn't you? Paul says how I held nothing back that was helpful. And what that means is, is that if we're going to live a life that influences this generation, we've always got to be a gener a influencers that teach, 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 teach. And when we teach and teach, it's not about us, is it? We're going to be pouring in even though when we know they may not understand it and it may not be the norm of what they're hearing. We've got to teach. We can't go away from the gospel. This generation is hungry for the gospel. When we sit down with this generation, there are times when we will have great chapel speakers coming in. But there are times where chapel speakers, they, they don't understand, and sometimes they'll, they'll share in chapel, and they may not go as deep in the Word, and then we'll hear the students going, man, I wish they'd have gone deeper today. And I'm like, God, this is great. They want, they want the meat. This generation's like that. And they're looking to us to teach them. But sometimes we stay quiet, 
And if we're going to be influencers, we are going to be, we're going to live a life of teaching. We're going to be pouring in to their lives, even on the mistakes that we've made. And even on the highlights, but we're going to be sharing with them the things that are right. I believe wholeheartedly this generation needs this. And if we, as His church, if we continue to stay quiet, we're not going to effectively influence this generation. Another point that we see today is, is practice daily obedience. And very quickly, as we see daily obedience, and the last point is daily commitment. But when you see daily obedience in verse 22, and see now I go bound in the spirit of Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. They understand what Paul's saying. There's like, well, that's who you are, Paul. Obviously, you're going to go bound in the spirit. You're going to not be distracted what's around you, and you're going to follow the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. But here's when we look at the word bound, it's a jail term or a prisoner type term, meaning, uh, meaning shackled, so to speak. And so when he would say that word, they understood the visual of what he was saying. And so therefore, in that time, we know that prisoners were, were shackled on their ankles, one on each ankle, and they had uh, um, a chain in the middle. They were shackled here, a chain connecting. And then they had a little round thing in the front where they would hook on to each prisoner. And who was leading the prisoner, or prisoners, was the jailer. And he was held responsible. He was held, uh, he was responsible for every uh, prisoner. And so he would latch on and he would guide them if he was moving them from one area to the other. They were all going in a line. And so he's simply saying, I go shackled, I go bound in the spirit, not knowing what will await me there. And so what we see there, what we learn from that little description in that, in that verse, or verses, is we see that Paul is going in the direction of the Lord and in the power of the Lord. And so when we are living a life of, of daily obedience, we can't be, we can't obey unless we go in the power and the direction of the Lord. And that's going to lead to daily commitment. But none of these things, in verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our heartbeat, isn't it? If we're going to li live a life of commitment, and we're simply saying it's not our life. Lord, you've got all of me. And there was a little bit of me when I was pastoring. I loved pastoring. Loved all about it. Loved my comfortable job there in, in seminary education, sort of like the, the tower, you know. <laughs> yes, we can tell you what to do here, you know. And the Lord says, I'm taking you out of that. I'm going to put you right in the middle of this generation. Thank you, Lord. You've had to remind me what obedience really is and what commitment really is. It's daily. It's a grind. It's a spiritual grind, isn't it? You wake up every morning and you say, Lord, uh, uh, love, love the, the daily refreshment that is in you, but oh God, I have no clue what's going to unfold today. And it's like the Lord is saying, I'm with you. Hold on for the ride. Be obedient. 
Let none of these things move you. No, no, if whatever distraction. That's what Paul was saying. Even chains and chip, tribulations await me as he's sharing this very solemn, solemn speech, so to speak, or, or uh, sharing with his friends. He says, even tri- chains or tri- tribulations await me, but none of these things move me or distract me from the will and power of God. Because I want my life to be joyous. I want my life to be um, uh, a life that, that uh, is, 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 in, um, is a life that, that is pleasing the Lord. And then he simply says, because it's for the grace and mercy and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, may we simply say, Lord, it's not about me, but it's about you. Thank you for redeeming a wretch like me. And then simply, I would encourage you in saying, Lord, all the things that you've allowed me to learn, all these things that you've allowed me to maybe obtain or whatever, I turn them over to you, oh God, and use every bit to teach and pour into this generation because you know better than I do. If we don't, if His church does not get with it, we will lose this generation. You know it. I don't have to tell you that. But God is desiring to use this generation and to use us to pour into this generation. For, not, for us not to be quiet anymore. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Don't worry about that. God's called you to be obedient. God's called you to pour in and, and to live a life of influence, a valiant life of influence to this generation. And may we take these passages and may we simply say, Lord, may we learn from these passages just as we saw a little glimpse of Paul's daily life in those three years. May we be encouraged by that. Love you very much. It has been a great morning for you. And before uh, we go and turn this over to the invitation, I want to pray for you. Father, you have called us and set us apart by your amazing grace and mercy not to be believers that literally just sit and watch. You have equipped us to be ones who live your grace and mercy in such a a way that pleases you. You have automatically given us influence. So Lord, we simply say, forgive us, O God. Forgive us for not being the men and women of influence that you have allowed us to be. Simply, we commit, uh, continue to commit and say, Lord, may nothing hold us back from being your influencers. May none of these things move us, nor do we consider our lives worth nothing in order to run the race with joy for the sake of the gospel of grace. That's our call, O Lord. And may we have a heart and may we have a passion, not only for this generation, but for all generations and all people. Use your church, oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Duffy. He did an amazing job, didn't he, guys? Yes. Yes. Um, Like every week, we want to give you guys a time to respond. Um, We certainly don't want to drag it out or anything, but if you 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 need prayer about anything, I would love to pray for you. Um, If you have questions about joining our church, I know Pastor Matt's away, but... We would love to answer that for you, but just everybody stand up. Let's sing a little bit, um, course of invitation, and then we're going to be dismissed, all right?
I hope you guys have a great Sunday. Uh, make sure you pray for the mission trip as they do their traveling. Pray for the Colorado team as well. We don't need any more flat tires or bus of tires. If you guys need anything, I'm here. You guys are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.